In Miami, a young man is abducted at gunpoint. The kidnappers demand a fortune and threaten to kill. The police and FBI uncover disturbing leads and look for answers in the smallest clues in a desperate race to find the victim and bring him home to his family. Kidnapping can shatter a family, bringing terror and heartache without warning. In 1984, with the flash of a gun, an ordinary business transaction became a violent abduction. In seconds, the son of a wealthy Miami developer was gone. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The kidnapper's motivation seemed to be money, but agents would learn this case and its resolution were more complicated than anyone believed. Miami, Florida, Tuesday, August 7th, 1984. At six o'clock, the sales office of real estate developer Jesus Portella was closing. Mr. Portella had emigrated from Cuba 22 years earlier, building a successful business in Miami. His 22-year-old son, Mario, was recently married and worked as a salesman for his father. As did Mario's uncle. A little after six, a couple approached the office. Mario and his uncle went out to talk with him. The couple asked about condo prices. The man seemed anxious as they spoke. The uncle explained that the office had closed. He asked them to return in the morning. At the couple's request, he went inside to get some brochures for them. He didn't see what was happening outside. An armed man had pulled up, and the three were abducting Mario. The uncle spotted temporary tags on the car, but only got the last three numbers. He told Jesus what he saw. Mario forced into a blue and gray car, heading north on 122nd Avenue. Then he called the police. But Mario's father couldn't wait for the police to arrive. He went looking for his son. Soon he spotted a car matching the description of the kidnapper's vehicle. For years, he had carried a licensed gun for protection. Now, he was ready to use it. But it was the wrong car. Realizing he couldn't find the kidnappers himself, Jesus returned to wait for the authorities. The Metro Dade police responded to the kidnapping call. 
For Detective Alvaro Romero, abductions were not unusual in 1984. At that time, we were inundated with kidnappings. We had probably one kidnapping a month related to narcotics or drug-related kidnappings, where the victims would either be involved in drugs themselves or possibly fam family members were involved in, in drug dealings. But detectives quickly realized Mario's abduction was different. Questioning Mr. Portella and, and recognizing the fact that he was a prominent businessman in the community led us to believe that it was not narcotics related and strictly a financial gain for, for the people who kidnapped his son. It meant anybody who knew of Mr. Portella's wealth could be a suspect. Hoping the kidnappers left some trace behind, crime scene technicians dusted the door for fingerprints. Mario's uncle believed they might have touched it as they peered inside. No usable prints were found. Less than an hour after the kidnapping, the phone rang. Hello? Speaking in Spanish, the caller asked for Mario. Mr. Portella didn't recognize the voice. The caller then announced he was part of a terrorist group that was holding Mario for $3 million in ransom. Although no recording equipment was in place, a Spanish-speaking detective listening in identified the caller's accent as Colombian. The caller threatened to kill Mario if Jesus notified police of the FBI and warned that the group was watching the Portela house and gave the address. The distraught father pleaded to speak with his son. The kidnapper announced he would call Jesus' home in three days. Police could not trace the call, but it helped them understand the type of criminal they were facing. We felt the kidnappers were very violent. Uh, they took precautions as far as the phone calls that they were making, and uh, they were very serious in their threats. They knew what they were doing, and we took them very seriously. As with any kidnap for ransom, Metro-Dade police called the Miami field office of the FBI for assistance, and the case went to Special Agent John Gill. The FBI was involved from the very onset. The very fact that a large ransom was demanded uh, caused it to fall into the jurisdiction of what we call the Hobbs Act. The Hobbs Act makes extortion affecting interstate commerce a federal crime, and Mr. Portella's business reached across state lines. Agents from the FBI's reactive squad installed recording equipment on Mr. Portella's office and home phones and arranged to have all incoming calls traced. The next day, Special Agent Gill wanted to talk with Jesus Portella but not at the trailer or at home. He asked Jesus to meet him at an empty garage. Agents watched the entrances and exits of the garage for any sign of the kidnappers, but did not see anyone. As far as they could tell, it was safe for Gil to question Mr. Portella. Portella. Yes. My name is John Gill. I have been assigned the administrator of this kidnapping. The agent asked if Mr. Portella knew of anyone who had a grudge against him or if he had ever been threatened. The worried father could think of only one minor incident. He said that eight months earlier, a man and woman burst into his office. He knew the woman. Her name was Rose de Parias. She recently purchased a condominium from him and said she discovered her neighbor's payments were lower than hers. Mr. Portella explained that the difference was because the neighbor had obtained a better finance rate. It was between the buyer and the bank. The payments were not made to him at all. The financier had paid for the condominium and he was out of the picture, so to speak. The two refused to accept the explanation. 
The man began threatening him, demanding that Portella refund the money. But there was nothing he could do. Before they left, Rose de Parias vowed she would get her money back one way or another. Mr. Portella had reported the incident to police. And the police talked to this particular woman and explained to her the circumstances of financing an interest payment. And she apologized, and Mr. Portella just assumed that this had all gone away. Agents later tracked down Rose de Parias and learned she was living in another state during the kidnapping. When they confirmed her alibi, they ruled her out as a suspect. Investigators were getting worried. With each day that passes, the chances of finding a kidnapping victim alive drastically diminish. They hoped the kidnappers would call again. And as a victim, I would get a if they did, the reactive squad was prepared, having wired Jesus Portela's home and office with telephone tap and trace equipment. Right? All right, I'll be there. Special Agent Gil Orantia and other investigators needed to be there to monitor the calls and run the equipment. But getting into the home unseen would be tricky. The initial calls and our indications were that they were watching his home, they being the kidnappers. We were concerned that they might be able to detect that I was coming in. They needed Mr. Portella's help. I was crouched in the back seat as we drove to his home. We went into the garage and then we went into the house. We wanted to be able to record the phone calls and be able to capture everything that was said to him regarding any ransom demands. Agents and Metro Dade detectives would take shifts staying with the Portella family 24 hours a day. They briefed Jesus on how to handle the calls. He would be the lead in the effort to get his son back. One of the things early on, obviously, was to determine if he's even alive or not. And we discussed with Mr. Portella some of the things that he could ask the kidnappers, which only Mario Portella would know, proof of life questions, if you would, that could come back to us to verify, yes, we know he's alive. In building a profile of Mario with details about his life, including favorite foods and names of pets, the agents got to know the young man. Mario Portella was the all-American kid. He had gone to school. He had maintained outstanding grades. He had just gotten married to a, a young lady, and they were newlyweds with a bright future. Everybody loved him. The reason that uh, this case was so traumatic for so many people is that so many people could identify with them. They were the type of family that we all aspire to be, and uh, they were living the American dream, but they ran into a nightmare. As promised, the kidnappers called three days after the abduction. The caller ordered Mr. Portella to listen to a taped recording. The voice on the tape was Mario. He pleaded with his father to pay the ransom money, warning the kidnappers was serious and would kill him if he called the police or the FBI. Jesus told the caller he had discreetly begun the process of securing the money from his bank. Agents reminded Mr. Portella to ask the proof of life questions, including what Mario's nickname was as a child and the name of the dog his wife used to have. The man agreed to call back with the answers. Mr. Portella had kept him on the line long enough for agents to trace the call to a Miami payphone. But the caller had gone before surveillance units arrived. In the harrowing days after the kidnapping, Mr. Portella received several other calls. Speaking in Spanish, 
a different man talked vaguely and mysteriously of a business proposition apparently unrelated to the abduction. The demeanor of Mr. Portello at the time was, I really don't have time to talk to you about business uh, because I have other problems. This individual indicated on several calls that he, in fact, was a person uh, that could help solve the problems. His persistence in trying to communicate uh, his involvement in whatever Mr. Patella's problem was caused us to be highly suspicious that somehow he was playing a role or a part uh, in the kidnapping or the ransom demands. Jesus kept the man on the line, and investigators pinpointed the source of the call. It was coming from the same area as the kidnapper's earlier call. Surveillance units made it to the scene in time to spot the person on the phone. They followed him to a fast food restaurant, where he emerged with a takeout bag. From their biographical profile of Mario, investigators knew the restaurant's burgers were his favorite. They then followed the man to an apartment complex, where his behavior was even more suspicious. When he took the hamburgers to an apartment and delivered them through the door, having no conversation uh, with the recipient. Uh, and this was the brand uh, of hamburgers that Mario and his father uh, fancied. Yes, at that point, we were suspicious that perhaps Mario was being held at that location. The SWAT team responded and set up outside the apartment. The clock was ticking. They needed to find Mario. In Miami, the FBI and Metro-Dade police were trying to find Mario Portella and whoever kidnapped him. Their first good lead brought them to a Miami apartment where they believed the kidnappers might be holding Mario. The SWAT team quickly secured the apartment and searched each of its rooms. But Mario was not there. It had been a false lead for FBI Special Agent John Gill. It was determined not only by search, but interview of the people there, uh, that they were not related or associated with the kidnapping whatsoever. Interviewing the caller, Agents determined he knew nothing of the abduction and was merely trying to get work with Mr. Portella's company. Investigators again were forced to wait for the kidnappers to make the next move. It was the original caller. He answered the proof of life questions correctly, suggesting Mario might still be alive. That's correct. And again demanded $3 million. As instructed, Jesus tried to keep the caller on the line. He said he had spoken to the bank and could only come up with one third of the amount. As Mr. Portella negotiated, agents traced the call to another Miami payphone. Units were on their way. Eventually, the caller agreed to $1 million. Trying to stall longer, Mr. Portella said it would take time to get the money since the bank was closed for the night. But the man ordered him to have it ready when he called back in three hours with instructions for the drop. Once again, he disappeared before authorities could arrive. Within the hour, Mr. Portella met plainclothes agents at his bank. Looks like it's all here. Go and sign for it. There, the FBI recorded the serial numbers of the bills that made up the million dollar ransom so they could be traced when the kidnappers spent them. At the Portella home, agents hid a tracking device in the briefcase, hoping it would lead them to wherever Mario was being held. The kidnappers called on schedule and gave Mr. Portella directions for the ransom drop. 
They ordered him to drive to a local restaurant, leave the car door unlocked with the money inside, wait for a call at a certain payphone, then go into the restaurant and sit down. The caller warned Jesus to go alone. With the loaded briefcases, Jesus began the trip. It took less than half an hour, but to the worried father, it must have seemed an eternity. The restaurant was in a tough and dangerous part of Miami. Undercover agents and Metro Day detectives were already there, watching. Agents also manned an empty apartment with a view of the restaurant. Jesus Portella arrived, carrying a million dollars in cash and hoping finally to get his son back. But he would soon discover that nothing was as the kidnappers said it would be. Jesus Portella was on his way to deliver a million dollar ransom in an unsafe part of Miami hoping to get his son Mario back. The way he handled the troubling and dangerous situation impressed the investigators working with him, including FBI Special Agent Gil Orantia. For him to have endured what he did, I have all the respect for him in the world. He performed very, very well. He did the things we asked him to. He did things that probably most of us couldn't do. The FBI and Metro-Dade police had undercover personnel staking out the restaurant. But the place was closed, and Jesus began to wonder if it was a setup. He found a payphone, though not where the kidnappers said it would be. He was nervous about leaving his car unlocked with a million dollars in it. He hoped the kidnappers would call before anything happened to him. If thieves made off with the money, he might never see his son again. Though he waited, the phone call never came. Eventually, Jesus had to leave with the ransom money, but without Mario. He and the investigators spent days waiting for the kidnappers to call again with new instructions. There were no ransom calls that came after the drop failed. We were concerned at that point because obviously um, our only connection to them were the phone calls. That was our connection to the bad guys. That was our ability to do something about what they were doing. And when they stopped calling, we became very worried. Although the kidnappers were not leaving new clues with ransom calls, older clues were beginning to pay off. FBI Special Agent John Hanlon was trying to find the car used in Mario's abduction. It was an older blue and gray four-door Chevrolet sedan and had temporary dealer tags, which were not in DMV databases at the time. And of course, with a paper tag, it can't be traced, so the car looks uh, perfectly legitimate and doesn't draw the attention of uh, law enforcement. Hanlon knew used car dealerships sometimes illegally rented cars that were for sale, placing temporary tags on them. He began phoning every dealership in the area. The time-consuming work paid off when Hanlon spoke to a clerk at one dealership in Miami. 
I asked her, you rent any old cars? And she said, sure, you know, and, uh, you know, any uh, old paper tags? And she said, yeah. And I said, any old Chevys? She said, yeah. I, said, I asked her, I said, any blue and gray ones? She said, yeah. I says, where is it? She says, it's here. And I said, well, uh, when, when, when was it rented? And she says, uh, uh, August the 7th. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. August 7th was the day of the kidnapping. When agents discovered the car had been returned the next day, they impounded it to have it searched for evidence. Metro-Dade forensics technicians processed the vehicle. They found no usable hair, fiber, or fingerprint evidence. But they did find a keychain under the back seat. The FBI knew that Mario Portella drove a Volvo. So we barreled back over there, picked up the keys, and we showed them to the family members. Of course, they identified them. It also fit his uh, automobile, and we took it by the house, and the, the house key fit his home. It meant that vehicle was most likely used to abduct Mario Portella. Checking records, agents learned a woman named Julita de Parias had rented the car. The clerk at the dealership said the woman came in with a man she said was her brother. Hanlon requested driver's license photos of Julita de Parias and her siblings. Nine days after the abduction, Hanlon met with the clerk who had rented out the car showing her a photo lineup that included a picture of Julita de Parias, along with several decoy pictures. The clerk identified Julita de Parias immediately. The clerk also identified the man who was with her. It was Julita's brother, Julio. Agents were familiar with the De Parias name. They remembered Rose De Parias was the woman who had had the dispute with Mr. Portella the previous year. Julita was Rose's sister. They now believed Julio De Parias was the man who accompanied Rose and threatened Jesus. Although the FBI still ruled out any involvement by Rose De Parias, her siblings were now prime suspects. Once we had good suspects in this investigation, we put surveillance on some of the members in an attempt to gather more evidence. The FBI noticed an unidentified man usually accompanied Julita. The couple seemed to be romantically involved. It had been 10 days since the abduction. Agents hoped the suspects would lead them to Mario Portella. They needed to question them, but doing so would alert any accomplices and put Mario's life at risk. We couldn't exactly jump them at that moment because we were trying to rescue this young man. That was our primary objective, to get this young man back to his family. So we continued to watch them. The FBI and Metro Dade surveillance effort included air and ground units. But the suspects seemed to be wary of a tail. They were very erratic uh, and paranoid in their behavior. Their driving would go in one direction and make a U-turn and go in another direction and then go through a parking lot and then in another direction, which was very taxing on our ability to surveil in as much as you only have a limited number of, of automobiles to conduct a surveillance. And when you're passing by the same subject three and four times in the course of one trip, uh, the chances of being identified as a surveilling vehicle are great. The suspect's counter surveillance techniques worked. Following them exhausted the helicopter's fuel supply, forcing agents to turn back. Ground units tried to remain undetected and keep the suspects in sight, but soon they lost them. It was a difficult blow to the investigation. 
Three days later, and 25 miles north of Miami, in the town of Davie, Florida, two teenagers were walking in a field when they made a grim discovery that would provide terrible answers to a family hoping for the best. 13 days after Mario Portello was kidnapped, teenagers discovered a body in Davie, Florida, 25 miles north of Miami. Davy police realized it was a murder. The man's head was completely wrapped with duct tape. Detective Ed Taylor faced the challenge of identifying the victim. All we knew at that time was it was a male. We didn't know how old he was because his entire head had been taped. His hands had been taped behind his back and his ankles had been taped together as well. So at the scene, we really didn't have very much information as to the identity of the victim or how old he was or anything of that nature. They needed to examine the body, tape, and sleeping bag for more clues and remove the evidence to the controlled environment of the lab. Dr. James Ongley, then associate medical examiner for Broward County, performed the autopsy. He removed the duct tape surrounding the head careful to preserve each tear and section for later analysis by forensics technicians. With the tape off, Dr. Ongley could describe the victim as male, between the ages of 20 and 40, five foot nine inches tall, with brown eyes and brown hair. Although the victim had been severely beaten, the cause of death was asphyxiation. He believed the man had been dead for 24 to 36 hours. To aid in identification, Dr. Ongley photographed the victim for comparison with photos of missing persons. But he knew the pictures would not be accurate representations of the victim. The tightly wrapped duct tape had distorted facial features, and the summer heat caused significant decomposition. We took uh, fingerprints from the victim so we could submit them to other departments to see if he had ever been arrested before. We uh, did a press release to the various newspapers with a description of the victim and ran a photograph of the victim to see if anyone could identify him. On August 25th, a Miami newspaper ran an article about the body found in Davie. FBI Special Agent John Gill noted the description loosely matched that of Mario Portella and immediately contacted the Davie Police Department about the abducted man. We had received prior dental records of Mario Portella from uh, his family dentist. And those records were in evidence uh, at the FBI office in the event that they were needed to identify a victim. Those records were brought to Davie, Florida. I met with uh, Detective Taylor, and we both proceeded then to the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office. Dr. Ongley uh, was then capable with his experience to take those dental films or x-rays and compare them to the body and positively identify that body as being our victim, Mario Portella. For everyone trying to bring Mario home to his family, the news was devastating. We had to notify the Portella family that the victim had been identified and deceased. Now agents were investigating a murder. Reviewing the complex case, they outlined their suspects. Julio de Parias, the man who had threatened Jesus Portela the previous year. His sister, Julita, whose name appeared on the rental contract for the abduction vehicle and the man agents believed to be her boyfriend. All three had disappeared. Agents also developed another suspect, Hector de Parias, Julio and Julita's brother. He was close to his siblings and had a criminal record. Now with no chance of finding Mario alive, the FBI's investigation could be overt they interviewed the sister of three of the suspects, Rose de Parias, who had threatened Jesus Portella eight months before the kidnapping. 
She denied any involvement and offered her full cooperation. She said Julita's boyfriend was Jesse Ramirez, and that if he and the others could not be found in Miami, they most likely went to Los Angeles where they had friends. Miami agents forwarded the lead to the Los Angeles field office. There, Special Agent Gregory Pack knew they had no time to lose. It was imperative to find these people as soon as possible because they are dangerous people and uh, they are people you don't want on the streets uh, in your city or anybody else's city. Uh, if they did this once, uh, kidnapped and murdered, what's to say that they wouldn't do it a second time to some other victim? Special Agent Pack needed to narrow the scope of the search. He knew the suspects were of Colombian descent and LA's Rampart District had a large Colombian population. I went out there with these very good photographs, and I went to all the places that uh, you and I would have to uh, go to occasionally uh, in normal course of living, dry cleaners, restaurants, hotels, motels, apartments. After a couple weeks of this door-to-door -door, you know, canvassing, I ran across a lady who was the apartment manager. I showed her the photographs. She recognized Hector, Julita, and Julio de Parias as new tenants, but said they seemed to be rarely at home. So I left my card with her and asked her if she would call me. And I called her at least once a day. This went on for probably eight or 10 days. Finally, in the evening, about nine o'clock, uh, I received a call from the office and this apartment manager was on the line and wanted to be Pat Shrew to me. So I accepted the call. And she told me that the people that I had been looking for uh, were in the apartment now. We approached the apartment house, uh, took up various positions so there wouldn't be any escape out the windows or, or other doors. And as we ran in the front door, there was a gentleman pointing a revolver at us. So we tackled him, uh, wrestled the gun from him, uh, took him into custody, and then there was another uh, person there. The man with the gun was Julita's boyfriend, Jesse Ramirez. He was held on charges of assaulting a federal officer. The other man in the room was Hector de Parias, Julita and Julio's brother. He was held on a parole violation for drug possession and burglary. Two suspects were in custody, but two were still at large. We knew Julita and Julio were still outstanding. So uh, when we left, I had two agents remain at the apartment. Several hours later, Julita came back. She was taken into custody, and then she was brought down uh, to FBI headquarters in Los Angeles. Agents waited for Julio de Parias, but he never showed. The case agent in Miami, John Gill, learned of the arrests. Gregory Pack, the special agent in the Los Angeles division, called our division here in Miami. I was immediately on an airplane the morning of the telephone call, met with Agent Pack at approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Los Angeles, where I briefed him on our experience and knowledge of the case. Jesse Ramirez and Julita de Parias refused to talk to investigators. But Special Agent Gill and Davy, Florida Police Detective Ed Taylor had more success with Hector de Parias they needed his help to find the fourth suspect, Julio de Parias. And they needed to know the details of Mario Portela's last days. On September 24th, 1984, the FBI apprehended three suspects in the kidnapping and murder of Mario Portela. But a fourth suspect, Julio de Parias, was still at large. Only one of the three in custody, Hector de Parias, agreed to talk. Still, he was evasive at first, and investigators caught him in several lies. 
Davy Police Detective Ed Taylor and FBI Special Agent John Gill decided on the soft approach to get the truth. We befriended him in the style of interrogation, realizing that the potential was there uh, to develop trust and cause him to, in a sense, confess. On the second day of interrogation, he became cooperative to the point that he was right on the edge of divulging, divulging his criminality. As he became more trustful of Mr. Taylor and I, he advised us that, yes, he would cooperate and divulge details. He was not involved in the abduction. But several days after the abduction, Mario was being held captive in an apartment. The brother, sister, and the sister's paramour discovered that maintaining guard on a kidnapped victim is a lot of trouble, and they needed help. They knew that Hector was available, that he was unemployed, and that he was addicted to marijuana, could not get a job, and in fact would jump at an opportunity to participate in a venture with financial gain. So they solicited his help to watch a victim, as he put it. According to Hector, the motive for the kidnapping was actually revenge. Julio de Parias felt humiliated that he could not force Mr. Portella to refund his sister's money after she purchased her condominium. Hector said that after several days, his brother Julio and Jesse Ramirez worried about getting caught and gave up on trying for a ransom. They decided they had to get rid of the only link to them, Mario Portella. So on August 17, 1984, 10 days after the kidnapping, they decided to murder him. Jesse Ramirez began wrapping Mario Portella's head with duct tape as he pleaded for his life and prayed. As Mario struggled to breathe, Jesse beat him with a metal bar. After the murder, Julio de Parias paid Jesse Ramirez $1,000 for the job. Hector claimed to have no idea of Julio's whereabouts but he did know where Mario was held and murdered. Hector not only was able to give us an address of, a, of an apartment complex and the building unit, Hector was even able to draw us a diagram of the interior of the apartment, uh, where the various rooms were, furniture, where the murder had taken place. A team of agents, detectives, and forensics technicians rushed to the apartment in Miami. They secured it as a crime scene and processed it for clues. Any evidence recovered might help put Mario's killers behind bars. But seeing it brought back to investigators the disappointment of not being able to save the young man's life. Special Agent Gil Orantia was there. As we entered this apartment, we saw a roll of duct tape on the side of a nightstand. We saw a bar that we believe was used to strike Mario with. We saw blood in the apartment. We saw all of these things that sort of put this thing, for us, evidentiary-wise, together. But it was a difficult thing to look at. It was, um, it was a situation where, you know, our goal was to to do the right thing and get him saved, and we couldn't do it. And it was, it was tough. It was tough for us to look at that. In addition to duct tape, investigators found pieces of adhesive medical tape in the room. They also recovered hair and fiber evidence. Everything was cataloged and sent to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. There, Special Agent Hal Dedman of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit analyzed the items. Well, my involvement in the case dealt with the comparison of hairs, textile fibers, and tape from the four locations, the body recovery site, the apartment where the victim was held, 
a car that the body was transported in, and another apartment where clothing from one of the suspects was recovered. He matched carpet fibers from those locations to samples found on the suspects and the victim. He also compared the tape wrapped around the victim's head, arms, and legs to the rolls of tape recovered at the murder scene. If you have two pieces of tape that were once original or adjoining sections of the same piece of tape and that tape is torn, the yarns are not all going to have the same appearance, they're not going to have the same uh, length. You'll have short pieces and long, long pieces. And you can fit these pieces of tape together much like you'd fit pieces together in a jigsaw puzzle. Special Agent Dedman determined the tear on the roll of tape from the apartment was a perfect fit with a piece of tape recovered from the victim's head. He also compared the tears on a strip of medical tape found on suspect Jesse Ramirez's shoes to those on the roll of medical tape found in the apartment and to those on a piece from the victim's body. It was another exact match. Each piece of evidence contributed, and the result was that there was a tremendously strong association between the suspects in this case and the victim. Jesse Ramirez and Julita de Parias were found guilty on kidnapping, extortion, and murder charges. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Hector de Parias pleaded guilty to the same charges and received 40 years. But the fourth suspect, Julio de Parias, was still out there. We believe that he could have fled to Latin America somewhere. So we printed up wanted flyers that you'd find in your post office and police departments. We sent them all over the place and we developed the same ones in Spanish. And we distributed them throughout Latin America. Almost four years after the kidnapping, in November of 1988, the FBI learned Costa Rican customs officials were holding a man who resembled the photo of Julio de Parias in the FBI's wanted poster. Special Agent Orantia flew to Costa Rica. The man did look like the photo, but it was his voice, the one from the ransom calls, that tipped Arantia off. I had listened to those phone calls over and over and over again, hundreds of times. I knew that voice. That voice was a part of me as much as anything's a part of me. So at the moment he opened his mouth, that was it. That was it. It cinched it. I knew it was him. The federal trial of Julio de Parias began five years to the day after Mario Portela's abduction. He was convicted of kidnapping, extortion, and murder, and sentenced to life. For the FBI agents who had gotten to know the victim's family, the convictions were important, but not the ending they had expected. This was a horrendous crime. For some type of justice not to come out of it, would have been difficult for the community in Miami and for the family, and I'll be honest with you, for us too, the agents. So I think the, the idea that some type of justice occurred is paramount. That's, that's the only thing we can, we can cling to, all of us, that at least they were caught. The Portella family has persevered. They will never forget Mario and they have not given up their dream.